afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of the Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia, a podcast series with Microsoft looking at the roadmap to net zero for Saudi Arabia, but for all of us, individuals and collectively as companies and societies, how do we build that roadmap to those very ambitious targets. In the case of Saudi Arabia, it's 2060 on net zero, other India, 2070, other parts of the world, 2050. And everybody after COP26 last year in Glasgow are busy trying to build the roadmap that gets us there. And of course, the Microsoft Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia is one small part to help the kingdom identify its roadmap and some of the elements that might be worth considering to be part of that. Today, we're talking about the circular economy, transitioning to a sustainable and climate resilient food system. Of course, 25% of global carbon emissions attributed to the agri-industry, a critical part of the business. 250 kilograms a year of food waste per individual in the Middle East, North African region. A plus, massive amount of low-hanging fruit, one might think in order tackling some of these big challenges. Let's kick off this uh, afternoon with Professor Mark Tester, co-founder and chief scientist at Red Sea Farms, been based in and around Saudi Arabia for a decade now, Mark. You must have a great insight to the world and how it's taking to this challenge. Your thoughts, opening comments on the theme of today's podcast. Um, it's great to be thinking about food in the context of the pathway to the roadmap to net zero 2060, because food is arguably, the food system is arguably the most polluting of all sectors of human activity. People think about transport or energy, but food really is enormously problematic, and particularly so in Saudi Arabia, where we're needing to import a large fraction of our staples and unfortunately also import a lot of our perishable goods. And a lot of those are brought in by air freight. So when we're looking at transport and the carbon footprint of transporting food in Saudi Arabia, especially the fresh produce, the footprint is enormous. And superimposed upon that, we also have a massive limitation constraints, of course, with water. And uh, water in the kingdom is, uh, is the elephant in the room when we're trying to consider anything to do with growing anything or sequestering carbon, you know, with trees or any of these other issues. Um, we really have to be extremely careful to consider not just just in inverted commas, CO2 and methane emissions, but also be considering the role or the constraints imposed on us by the limitation of water in kingdom. And just to follow up quickly on that, Mark, when you think of the kingdom and you think of the context of the title of our session here, one of the big words that stands out to me is transitioning. Uh, the, the change from a, point A to point B. Uh, what is, do you think, in the context of this discussion, climate resilient food system, what is the biggest hurdle or, her, you know, one or two of uh, the Saudi challenge to that transitioning piece going from A to B? I think one of the issues we need to consider is the the the, the maximising of value of the water that we are using and uh, that value in terms of human nutrition and dollar values, both are important. And really, when we've only got a limited amount of water there, we need to be using that very intelligently and very strategically. So if we are wanting to consider overall carbon footprint of our food system, we should be maximizing the importation. It's an unfashionable thing to say, but we should be maximizing the importation of our staples because they can be transported by surface in bulk with, for the amount of calorific and other nutritional returns, very low carbon footprint. And we need to be maximizing the production. We need, be, we need to be transitioning our farming systems away from production of staples and increasing the production of perishables. So then we're reducing the air freight into kingdom of perishables. And that would make a massive contribution to reducing the carbon footprint of our kingdom's food sector. Let's that's a well, big challenge. 
that is certainly a big challenge given the uh, I mean a lot of water has already been consumed in the in the Saudi agri sector with the, 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 in the uh, by Irish people I know because they've been building the farms there in Saudi Arabia for many years thinking yes. maybe that they were still in Leitrim and no longer in the desert uh, we'll come back to that Mary Therese Langer Nade uh, Marketing Director, Near and Middle East, and Strategy Director for Africa of Veolia. Uh, your opening thoughts, Mary Therese. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for your insight, Professor. And uh, I completely agree with what was said uh, about uh, the way we are using the, the, the water. Yeah, I think that uh, when it comes to agriculture, it's key. And uh, uh, the, our um, aim in Veolia, because it's uh, it's just what we are focused on. It's our purpose. It's wh what where we can help our our client uh, is to uh, maximize that uh, uh, water production, that what what uh, uh, usage, and uh, uh, be able to maybe uh, use water uh, and what we are calling in our uh, profession drinking water to really specific uh, uh, area of, uh, of, uh, of humanity needs, uh, which means, uh, for instance, when it comes to grass, maybe we could use, uh, reuse water just for grass and just, uh, you know, um, take the water where it is and use it for uh, humanity and uh, the really needs of, uh, um, um, of feeding humanity. Uh, in uh, in the best way possible, uh, reducing all the leakage and this uh, in that at that point, here comes uh, for for instance digital, and we are uh, developing in Veolia what we call uh, um, a, a smart water system, which means that we are just like thinking wherever we can how we can preserve water. Uh, in the, in uh, avoiding liquid, um, gi giving the water the right amount of water at the right place for the right person. And this, for me, is key in the future. Mary Therese, I'd welcome just a follow up uh, on, on given your uh, particular focus and expertise uh, uh, in your industry for Viola on Africa. Of course, the COP27 is the uh, hosted in Egypt is the first time climate conference arrives in Africa, of course, in North Africa. But nonetheless, I'd welcome where does Africa sit in the context of its challenge of transitioning. Of course, Saudi Arabia, a very wealthy country. Many countries in, Sa in Africa don't have the wealth but have other challenges. What are the challenges of the transition to a more sustainable uh, uh, climate-aligned uh, uh, agricultural industry? I think that uh, Africa right now, what we are seeing uh, is considering his uh, self-sustained a way of uh, bringing or, or, or being able to feed themselves, and we've seen we have we are seeing some regions that are just like uh, taking uh, food security and then agriculture and making making it as a strategy, as a filiere they had to just like reach and maybe be able to be uh, for their own uh, um, able to feed themselves and. Tomorrow, because maybe they've got the, the, the people that could be uh, that are available on, on the territory to be able to uh, accelerate and become a kind of territory where agriculture can be a, a, an, a larger part of the economy and being kind of a, a, a farm or agriculture for the rest of the world. And maybe something like this should be uh, thought and maybe should be helped a little bit more than it is today. And uh, for instance, I'm taking one of our, um, uh, one of the country we are helping with this, which is Namibia, who went really from uh, recycling water to drinking water and just like closing the whole loop. And maybe it's just like something that in some part of, of the world, we, we will have to think about because it's just like the solution. It's better doing this than letting just like children drinking water that is anyway unconsumptional for them. Let's welcome to the table Suhail Jabir, General Manager, Saudi Arabia for Foodix. 
And so, Hale, I welcome your opening thoughts. Again, just reminding ourselves of the topic of the podcast, the question of the podcast, circular economy transitioning to a sustainable and climate resilient food system. So, Hale, your opening thoughts. Uh, first of all, thanks, everybody, for being a part of this call. It's an absolute honor. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for, for us at Foodix is the three R's, right? So reduce, remove, reuse. Uh, our treasure trove is based off of data. It's based off of insights. It's based off of information. Uh, we operate around 100,000 terminals deployed in the market. We witness F&B operators uh, deboning, reusing, removing a lot of the ingredients that they utilize to run their day-to-day -day operations, right? Uh, we think it's an important cause. Uh, we also believe and know wholeheartedly that it takes a lot more than one person or one entity to, to kind of push this change across the region, whether it's Saudi, whether it's Africa or any other nations or, or, or countries globally. Uh, but we do think that it starts with the right data. So, Hale, just to follow up on, on some thoughts from the ground in Saudi Arabia, I was reading some reports in preparation for our call today that um, of the many sort of you know, keeping everything on the table uh, for consideration uh, in, in the kingdom, it was one idea to uh, tax people for or penalize people for leaving food on their plate in restaurants. Uh, I'm wondering from your point of view of that sort of granular impact, that kind of granular policy, is there room for that in this solution to the circular economy? Uh, I think financial repercussions would be a great approach. I don't see taxing them uh, being the, the, the efficient push forward, right? I think making it more of a feasible and an economically affordable opportunity to, to funnel into homegrown products, right? With, with entities such as uh, Red Sea Farm being available, in the kingdom, I think I think what they're doing is a heavy push towards making you know purchasing products from them more economically and financially efficient than importing them uh, from external countries or external parties. Mark, of course, Red Sea Farms is is looking at, and I know you wear many hats, professor and and scientist, uh, developing technologies that are applicable, obviously, in in fairly stressed environments like the desert environment, the arid environment of Saudi Arabia, but making that available to other uh, other air, other parts of the world. Um, speaking of this idea of transitioning to perishables production rather than staples, is that something that Saudi is particularly aligned to do? Is that a, a, a challenge? We'll talk us through a little bit about that, what the alignment, because sometimes you find that unique stressed environments can be, you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of innovation. Yes, that's exactly right. And it's fantastic that Saudi Arabia has done things like established KAUST um, and is really trying to seed quite a lot of research and innovation. And what I also like that's very good in Saudi Arabia um, is the way they really are. We are really focusing on trying to not just do the research, but really deliver innovations into a whole range of sectors, the food sector in this conversation. And so that's how Red Sea Farm spun out was because we were doing research at KAUST and we really were encouraged and helped to get through that valley of death that startups suffer and actually now we're in a rapid growth phase. And so, yeah, I think Saudi's a good environment for doing things like like what we're doing. You know, we're trying to substitute fresh water with salt water, for example, as much as is technically possible and economically viable, economically feasible, and trying to uh, incorporate solar energy into the structures of greenhouses. And uh, those are like two examples where we're really trying to um, do things and being in the Saudi context, of course, we're doing what we're doing because we there's a market here and there's a need. So yes, I think the the stressed environment is uh, stimulating invention and stimulating the right environment to enable us to develop, but deliver the inventions. So no, I, I, I think it's great here. And yeah, Red Sea Farms, hopefully just one of many examples that are gonna be bubbling out over these coming years in Saudi. And uh, when you talk about this transition um, uh, from the open field staples based agriculture to uh, providing more perishables, I would hope 
that that would also come and that's why we're doing what we're doing so it sounds like a talking with a conflict of interest, but you know, it's we're doing what we're doing because the, we sincerely think there is a need for this um, to, to, to improve, to increase the amount of covered controlled environment agriculture and to minimize the environmental footprint of that controlled environment agriculture. And so for example, a kilo of tomatoes in Saudi Arabia in the open field or even in a polytunnel, that takes like 350 liters of water, fresh water, just for a kilogram of tomatoes. If you put them into a mid to high tech greenhouse, it's the same amount of water being consumed <laughs> instead of it evaporating in an open field, it's being used to cool the greenhouse. So if we can substitute fresh water with salt water, for example, um, that can really have a big, big energy saving, a uh, big water saving. And uh, and I think that's what, that's what this kingdom needs, yeah. Just wanted to pick up on, on a point and put it to you, Mark, that uh, Mary Therese mentioned regarding um, the, the the reuse of water. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I'm particularly referencing produced water. When you produce oil, uh, yes. uh, you produce a lot of associated water. Uh, calling it water is a bit of a, a generous term because it's quite toxic. But nonetheless, yeah. it can be. There's a, a different countries different volumes of produced water come with a barrel of oil. It is a source for other uses, maybe not for drinking, but for cleaning and agriculture. Where is that as a solution in the kingdom? Uh, how serious is it? How advanced is it? Uh, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, what, what we uh, intend to do, and we are doing this in Saudi either, uh, is a, a request from the kingdom to go from uh, uh, solid water, so uh, seawater, to just like be introduced in the uh, oil uh, sector and the oil process. Uh, and the, the thing is that when you come to uh, to switch from just like drinking water to that salt water, and Professor, you are, you are right, it's just like bringing more drinking water to some other people and, and uh, just like uh, taking the right water for the right thing. And that's, that's what we need to do. And uh, going from uh, um, salt water or sea water to, 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 to um, go to that uh, um, process of oil, which is needful. We need that uh, fossil um, energy because our economics need it. But uh, trying to find the right water for the right thing is from from our perspective, from Veolia perspective, the right thing to do. And knowing that we've made a really great, great, great innovation on all those process, uh, which we uh, we all yeah. know, uh, uh, transforming uh, seawater to a, a water that is uh, uh, can be inject in in industrial process and going from seawater to drinking water either. So we have to think on all the solution that can just help us to feed the 9 billion people we are becoming and do it in the less environmental uh, illness, I would say, and the break that we could. So Hale, you're obviously a private uh, sector, private sector company, private sector solution in, in a country that uh, is very uh, sort of government-led, gov big government companies, ministry. I mean, it's a very much a state-led economy to a great extent with a developing private sector, obviously. And But I'm just wondering from your point of view, where those two meet in this solution? The, the, the role of the private sector, is it reliant on the government leading or can the private sector lead from the ground in the kingdom? Your thoughts on that as part of the solution? Uh, I'd like to I'd like to compare it more to a tandem bike, right? Uh, what we've witnessed in the past couple of years is 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 very uh, a very heavy focus on empowering the right private sectors and empowering the right private entities, right? If your cause is is driving towards the vision 2030, you have the utmost support from every entity, whether it's government or private industries such as Aramco, Savic, and these and these mega conglomerates locally. We have to keep something as well in mind, right? So 70% of the Saudi population is under the age of 30 or 31 years old. So the the will to want to shift and the will to want to... Sorry, I just want that statistic to resonate again so it's clear. 70% of the Saudi population is under 31 years of age. Correct. Wow. 31 or 32, give it either plus or minus. Uh, you right. know what I mean? Uh, so... so and that's yeah. it. That's 
a massive opportunity or a massive burden, right? So let's uh, opportunity. Let's see. I mean, what, what we've witnessed in the past couple of years, it's been a massive opportunity, right? The, the, the shift upwards and the uptick and in, in, in becoming more, you know, uh, economically viable and making the right decisions to shift for the vision 2030. I think it's, it's proven that it is definitely in the benefit of the kingdom to kind of uh, tap the shoulders of these young, bright individuals, attract international investments and international companies to kind of push towards the same vision as well. Mark, speak a little bit about that and where that intersects. I just want to get on to the idea of the linear to the circular economy. How And, and when you take the Saudi piece there, the demographic, a very youthful demographic in the kingdom, uh, where those three things intersect, the, the, the nexus of moving from linear to circular, uh, with a with a young population. Well, the, 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 I, I so agree with what Sahel just said. The, the, the youth of Saudi Arabia is the great hope for the future of Saudi Arabia. Um, I think it's a, a country, well, it's obvious it's a country that's changing massively, and this is really being driven by, by the young people. And um, young people, they know it's essential um, for circularity to be increased in our economy we've already got some it, it's it's a concept it's not a rule <laughs> circular economy um and it's a very useful concept but um young people are a hundred percent um understanding the massive importance of this and so i think that just provides more 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 energy for for doing this you're seeing recycling company emerging you're seeing all sorts of I want to just jump in on that point because it, clearly there, it, when it comes to food uh, the, and, and water, as we talked earlier, there's a lot of sensitivity about reusing produced water, not because it's not uh, functional, uh, but it's because it's perceived culturally mm. dirty. There's a cultural challenge. Uh, and for the producer, for the point of view of food and food circu circular economy, the, the same kind of challenge culturally would exist. Is that mean that ultimately the solution has to be before the food is on the plate, that the production of rather than the reuse and recycle after? Uh, you've got to do Mark. both, don't you, Mary Therese? I mean, I think you've got to do both. I mean, we have to use less water for the production of the food, we have to be more intelligent with the use of the water that we are using, <laughs> uh, like I said at the very beginning. Um, and then I think we have to be, of course, recycling waste, recycling food, uh, re water waste. Uh, I, I love when Mary Therese is talking about, you know, reducing leaks, and I think that sort of thing is what she meant. This is this is um, it's it's critical, it's central, and there's no rules. And and I also love when Mary Tree's talked about um, you know IT and digital technologies. This provides huge opportunities, and young Saudis are good at this. They're really good at a lot of deploying digital technologies for increasing efficiencies, reducing wastes. There's no it needs to be tackled at, at multiple levels. Barry Trace, if you could pick up on that point uh, and, and also talk a little bit about next steps, because what there's many pieces to the challenge and the solution. What are the next steps? What should be the next steps? I, I think that, uh, that, that the concept of the four R's are the good concept because they are easy for people to keep in mind. How do I reduce? What do I reduce? I reduce my water consumption. How, what do I have to, re, to reuse? I have to reuse all the perishable. And the perishable, what, they, what, do, what can they become? They just like can become uh, energy tomorrow. And it's, it's critical, the energy thing. How, how, how are we making loops of energy from perishable? And that's what we are doing uh, every day in Veolia. And, and from that, what can I recycle? What from all that those uh, uh, production? What will I recycle? And what do I have to remove? And for instance, what do I have to remove from the soil? From the soil, we have just like a use for our agriculture. Uh, how do we remove a pesticide? How do we remove everything that at a point? How do we remove CO2? Uh, so at a point, those four R's are what people have to keep in mind to accept that uh, they are a solution. The, the, the solutions are there, 50% at least are there. We have to increase uh, the, the solutions and we need everybody. 
I don't think that today one person, one company will hold all the solution. It's a combination of solution. And when we will just like find, uh, for instance, we as Veolia, we've uh, um, just like partnership with another uh, nice, nice uh, company uh, in France that uh, uh, with whom we are just like producing energy, energy from waste. And that is the solution. We don't have the, 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 the technology. They have the technology. We've got the feedstock and we, we combine this and we just like go further. I really you, believe that. You, you mentioned Marie Therese France there. Of course, France is going through a very stressed water situation at the moment, Absolutely. as is the UK. I mean, Red Sea Farms, their technologies for stressed environments, I think that's everywhere now. Uh, 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 and most significantly in, in Europe this summer, uh, what do we learn from that, that in deploying major transformation in a, in a sort of sort of greenfield opportunity like Saudi Arabia? What, what can we learn from this terrible situation that Europe is stuck with, this legacy infrastructure? What we see today and what, what uh, our, our CEO, Estelle Brechenov, is just like reminding all the time, it's that in France, where we are in front of the technology, we are using 0.5% of, uh, of our water, 0.5. While uh, just like region has a Spain, will just like reuse 20% of their water. So the, and it was just like a, a, a lack of, uh, uh, yeah, it can see something like cultural behind that. So yeah, how do we, just shift pe uh, so people mindset on the reuse and when what i was saying maybe do it in a uh, by step for grass just for grass it, we don't eat grass so it's okay using reuse for grass yeah. we do eat grass through cows right or beef <laughs> and, uh... through cow, maybe but 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 not in every part of uh, you know when you are in the city you don't have cows but you get you get grass everywhere. So, Hale, I wanted you to speak to that point of next steps because I do think it's quite important as we come into our sort of closing thoughts about how to bring this home in terms of to make. I mean, the, as you said, uh, seventy percent under thirty-two is a huge opportunity. It can also be a huge challenge. Employment and other big issues that go along with keeping th that population engaged is. But the next steps concept in, in uh, to be taken to establish a self-sufficient food system in Saudi Arabia and perhaps worldwide. But your thoughts on next steps? Uh, so you know, as as Mark and Maria stated, there is not a single entity I think globally that can take on this mission by themselves, right? I think it's it's about people understanding the intrinsic value and extrinsic value that they bring to the table understanding what the beneficial factors are there for a private entity such as uh, Foodix or Red Sea Farms, as well as government entities. It is, it is a massive task force that needs to kind of collaborate and build a coalition to drive this forward. Uh, I think there's enough uh, entities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as this is, what, this is where we're based out of today, that are definitely willing to spearhead this challenge, right? Like I said, you know, for us at Foodix, we're, we're heavily technology-based and we have a treasure trove of data, right, that we could funnel into the right parties who can lobby for the right decisions. Uh, it takes more more than one entity or one company or one person to lead this. But I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has an ample amount of people willing to spearhead this, uh, this transition. Mark, your closing thoughts, again, it seems the good news of this story in so many ways is that as Eric Trace just highlighted, we only consume 0.5% of our water in, the, in, 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 uh, in France. And, and I know in my home country, Ireland, we waste, it's just ginormous of lost water and leakage. Uh, there's 250 kilos of waste food from each person in, in MENA. So there's obviously enough food and to a certain extent, it seems enough water, but this problem is the process, is the structure. Is the, just speak to that as your closing thoughts as to where the good, the good news, bad news piece is to this uh, transformation from linear to circular. Yes, well, the the bad news, of course, is that the the needs are urgent and enormous, and um, the problems of water supply and energy 
CO2 emissions um, uh, are, are overwhelming. The good news is that there's lots of opportunities for technology and innovation to make significant contributions to trying to reduce the environmental footprint of our food production systems. I would suggest that this needs to be facilitated greatly in Kingdom and in the region by alterations of policies uh, to help facilitate the adoption of innovations. Uh, for example, let's charge the real price for water. To have, um, to have subsidies for a lot of these fundamentals in, um, in, in this kingdom and in this region. It's not just this kingdom, but in the region. Um, I think we really do need to improve the market base of the economy, reduce subsidies, and, um, and that will really facilitate the adoption of innovations. Mary Therese, let's give you the last word uh, this afternoon in context of maybe speak to COP27 coming to Egypt, coming to Africa. Uh, what opportunity does that present? I mean, Mark just referenced that price for water. We still don't even have a price for carbon. Uh, at least two yes. major uh, pieces of the solution. Can we hope and expect COP27 delivers something on a pathway to a price on these major uh, uh, gateways to this solution. Your thoughts on the role that COP27 can play in the region uh, this November? There are great hope. There are really huge hope on that COP27 to bring on the table the fact that the one who is emitting should be the one who is paying. You cannot uh, assume that the one who are not emitting are the one who will pay for everybody. The thing is that we have to accept that uh, our economy and our production has an environmental, an, an environmental cost. At that point, uh, whenever in our economy, we are making that shift of saying the price of being a good producer. So the less you will just like have a, a, a footprint on the environment, the, the more valuable your product is. And that's what we, uh, the, the shift we have to do, probably, and accept to invest on the, th th that transition will cost something. It will cost something. And we have to accept, just as uh, uh, after the, the last uh, big war, the last uh, second war, that we had to put a lot of money to tackle the tide. And that's what we all need to do for our next generation. Those young will not accept us to just like dilapid for their their their, uh, their their future and their life, so we have to do things right away. Well, we're going to have to have to wrap it up there. Maybe the next time we're having dinner together in Riyadh, we'll look at the bill and they'll say, "Well, this hamburger is ten gallons of water, so that's X rials on your bill." or something like that. But we must wrap it up there. It'd be great chatting with the three of you. Thank you so much, yes. Professor Mark Tester, co-founder and chief scientist at Red Sea Farms, Mary Therese Langer, Nadei, of, uh, direct marketing director for Africa at Veolia, and Suhail Jabir, general manager, Saudi Arabia at Foodix. Really appreciate you being on the Microsoft uh, Sustainability Dialogues in Saudi Arabia, a, 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 a series that we hope you'll come back to uh, as we progress in our discussions on all of these topics. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you for having us.